I literally think that certain kinds of intelligence pervade the universe, from simple particles all the way up. It's pretty ubiquitous in nature, and including in the inorganic world. It's definitely surprising along the way to humans. Animals are doing much more than we could ever imagine. And we have different pinnacles of intelligence at different places. We don't quite get how smart plants are. It has to do with both their intelligence and our lack of skills in appreciating their smarts. We can use new materials and technologies now to do things that we couldn't do before. And now we're finally able to have the body of data and the capabilities to take that seriously and to develop a completely new framework for how minds uh, come into being in this world. Diverse intelligence is a multidisciplinary field that tries to understand what is common to all intelligence, regardless of its origin story, meaning whether it was evolved or engineered or both. Diverse intelligence for me means what do the animals need in their environment? So we think in terms of adaptation. There are, for example, birds who, who stash food and they can remember 10,000 locations of food. The bat has echolocation. In a dark room with just one insect, the bat can catch the insect. It's just amazing that they can do that. Human morality has a few unique elements, but at the basis of it are certain emotions like empathy, reciprocity, fairness. All of these things can be seen in primate societies. We would put two monkeys side by side. You can give them both grapes, fine. You can give them both cu cucumber, fine. But if you give one of them grapes and the other one cucumber, and grapes are much better than cucumber for them, they become very upset, the one who gets the cucumber at least. <laughs> So, so in that sense, I think you could probably talk of moral systems because they, they, they have rules of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. I studied fish that have complex social relationships just like chimpanzee. To check animals have self-awareness or not, we usually use mirror mark test. Fish sees a mirror at first time. We think fish is testing hypothesis at that time that if on reflection moves in the same way as myself, then this reflection is myself. We're trying to uh, get into the diverse part of the diverse intelligences. And the octopus is literally as close as you can be to the antipodes of uh, human beings in both phylogeny and behavior. The octopuses are asocial. Uh, they don't live in communities, they don't participate in communities. They are curious. They act uh, towards us 
in a way that I would call sociable. They are capable of solving extremely complicated puzzles. They learn a lot of things by themselves in the wild. Most octopuses are spending their lives avoiding becoming prey because they have nothing to protect them. So one of the questions is, if we remove their shelter and give them other objects, how might they use that in creating a new shelter? Octopus immediately starts putting this here, this there, okay, trying to rearrange the environment. And this manipulation of the environment is a fundamental component of the definition of intelligence. As a scientist, I love exploring intelligence in other animals because other animals can come up with ways of surviving and thriving in the world that's completely different than us. Plants are constantly updating and changing on the fly the way they deal with both resources and the way they interact with forms of life, animals, fungi, around. If there is a good reason to, to track neural correlates of cognitive abilities and consciousness in the case of animals, the same applies in the case of plants. You don't need neural tissue to speak of information flow and apply cognitive science for example, take legumes. We are working with climbing beans. Now, one question is, do they simply grow uncontrolled or do they control endogenously the pattern of growth? So we time-lapse climbing beans and on top of that, we can insert two electrodes, amplify the signal and, and see what's happening inside the plant. Put it this way, plants must have their own personality. If responses were pre-programmed, they wouldn't exhibit all the flexibility in their behaviors that we know they exhibit. And I keep missing it because I don't quite learn their language. We need to learn how to resonate with them, scientifically speaking. Fundamentally, pretty much every medical issue except for infectious disease would go away if we knew how to communicate to a group of cells what they should build. And so in my lab, we deal a lot with the way that collective intelligences of cells, so this is embryos and, and organs and so on, how the collective intelligence of cells is able to solve different problems. What I'm interested in is this is this spectrum. It's a um, it's a continuum from extremely simple active matter on the left side, all the way through various kind different different kinds of minds, different kinds of um, uh, cognitive uh, systems, all the way to humans and whatever is past that on the right hand side. For any given system, whether it's biological or engineered or whatever, the answer to where it fits on that continuum is an empirical experimental question. And so the question of how much intelligence there is in any given system is not to be decided by philosophical debates about how things have to be, but actually by making hypotheses and doing experiments. I think this is what uh, the field of diverse intelligence is going to do. Really develop a science of being able to recognize, predict, interact with, and, and then of course create as well, multi-scale cognitive systems. I hope that these ideas can be pushed into very practical advances for improving embodied existence. quite surprising how much computational power can be packed within a, a single cell. Obviously, once we start talking about the intelligence and the emotions of animals and accept that they have inner lives that are sometimes quite complex, we have to treat them better than, than what we do. We cannot think of plants as objects. We have to think of them as agents. Because, of course, the better they do, the better we will do. But in so far as we only think of them as objects that we need as resources to exploit, 
we are doomed. I think that the more we learn about these animals and as scientists share information publicly, hopefully we'll engage other people in being interested in these animals, treating them hopefully with more respect and being concerned about their environment, which is our environment. I think it's time where we can actually take both developmental and evolutionary biology seriously. It all hinges on being able to recognize and communicate with unconventional minds in the world around us.